First, uh, are there any questions of understanding to the to the four guys? No? So let's try to to, to to start the discussion in a way. Christian, I don't I don't really get what was your message to show this this piece in the context of our discussion. It's a it's more um, I don't know it was more intuitive, but I think that it's about the mythos atelier. I wanted to make you know that also atelier for you can have different you know um, reasons to have them and. Um, I think it will always stay like a format, you know, like if you say the artist, the same feeling I got, you know, it's funny to see the translation from Carrie's work and it just stands, not Carrie, uh, but it stands the artist. So immediately you project something on it in a different sense. And so similar like studio for me, something that will always be there as a thing to play with as a format. And then I, I, I took this because then the atelier itself became um, just together, of course, with the clean, cleaning team, uh, important part of the of, of the work to become a sculpture or to become a, to create new art out of art. Yeah, but do you think a, a studio nowadays is more than a than a cliche or it's more than a? I don't think a studio exists for me. Like a studio is just wherever you can do something that keeps an artist active can be called studio. Wherever you you do something that leads to the creation of an artwork in any form can be called a studio. I mean, I think it's also not a, a new idea, but I, um, I was, I don't know, when I was an art student, there, there was a postcard once lying around, and it was anonym, but there was just on this postcard, there was just a person you saw from the back, and you saw a street, and it said, uh, the artist in his atelier in the studio. And I don't know, I kept this anonymous postcard a long time because it was somehow for me very inspiring. You know, for, for me, it was my idea of a studio when I was a student. I had the imagination, which might be cliche, but that you work in a space that is somehow um, has a certain look. But then there's this postcard, and it was inspiring to see, OK, this person is probably an artist you see from the back, and the background is probably an atelier, and why not? And it, I think it's stimulating to see in that sense. I mean, at least it stimulated me. Well, I don't think it's that hard to see where, where the video might touch upon some of the subjects uh, that should be at stake, I think, in this session. I think what the video, your work actually shows us is the, the way the mythos is not only upheld, but also through reconstructions continuously reproduced. And um, there are many other uh, examples, like Philip and I just quickly started to name other examples of studios that have been reconstructed, reproduced. I think the most famous example, and I think it's almost, it's almost an arti artistic project is the one by Francis Bacon that, well, this Namjoon Pike studio also traveled over an ocean, you know, it flew almost to another continent. So the idea that the space can travel is already a fabulous idea. And for the Francis Bacon studio, they used this Italian strappo technique, which is how you m remove frescoes and then to m bring them back on the wall. So I don't know how they did this with the Namjoon Pike studio because they had telephone numbers and yeah. so on. Also yeah. the walls of the Giacometti studio are being kept. And I think what's really interesting from a contemporary perspective is as a viewer, once you, you know, I've seen many of them because I, I am really crazy about them, you don't know what you're looking at. And that I think, for, I, I find that in a highly intriguing positions. Uh, position, for example, in the Francis Bacon studio, there are works in there, they're all fake because they've been remade. This whole process of reconstruction is such an, an intricate uh, uh, enterprise of curatorial uh, belief in authenticity and then uh, projections towards the viewer that we need to see the original, that we gain knowledge from a site like this. Or, you know, I can name, I'll name one other example, which I find equally, it's, it's funny almost, is the Morandi studio in Bologna. When he died, it was in the flat of his sister, I think, and also mother, um, sister. 
And then they moved it to the town hall. They made the reconstruction in the town hall. And then after a few years, they moved it back into the flat. So this thing has moved back and forth and you get, and now they even changed a few pieces so you can see where a frame used to hang and then not really because they turned it into a museum. So I think the traditional studio is haunting many practices, not only the ones of artists, but also curatorial, critical. Uh, the fact that the, post, the, the term post-studio is still so in vogue uh, also, I think, points at the fact that we need the term, but we want to discard it, and so on. So. I have a very uh, practical question to, to carry. You said you don't have, a, you never had a studio. So you, you don't have a studio. I mean, I have a desk. But I think this is like the least interesting conversation. And that's not a rude answer. Mm -hmm. I just I honestly don't care. Mm -hmm. You know, I just mm -hmm. make my work. It doesn't really matter. And that's, you know, I know some for practical reasons, certain artists need to have bigger spaces. Mm -hmm. But, you know, really, um, I think is kind of the wrong like it's becoming a kind of fetish this kind of question of the reconstruction of the studio or you know even wanting to see um, a deceased artist studio which I'm sure we all want to see you know we're all fascinated by that and the context from which um, these works have been made but at the same time it is a massive fetish I, I did read this um, you know very interesting Daniel Buren text on the way here he was writing about the studio and talking about Brancusi's studio and how um, the, the, the kind of opening up of Brancusi's studio um, was you know, the only way to see Brancusi's work in context, really. It was the best way to see his work, um, was the work situated in his studio. And I thought that was an interesting notion, but this Nam June Pike studio doesn't have any work in it. Maybe it only relates to sculpture works or painting um, as a comment, but... Yeah, I think there's an, there's an interesting question there about the studio without the work in it, just being a fetish item, really. Yeah, no, this, this, this is a fetish issue, which I think is, this is quite obvious also in, in the Namjoon Paik uh, case uh, and, and um, in the case you showed us where this fetish is sort of produced in the museum against all knowledge of the museum. But beyond that, I, I wonder... Um, it, if the, the what, what you talk about, sort of the, the fact to have a space where you go to it in the morning, or I don't know, to sort of have a, a, a regular space. Okay, in my case, as a, as an historian, I I feel that I need a space where I can sort of open and close a door, sit down, where there's some books here and there. I know that this is this is sort of archaic and anachronistic in some sense. And it's um, it's it's a retreat, an ivory tower. But I feel that I, I, I sort of need that in order to um, uh, to be able uh, to sort of produce. And if I don't have that, it's I don't have to use it all the time. But if if I know it's not there, it's difficult. So I wonder if your uh, your practice uh, can work without the fact that you know that there is this place sort of waiting being around, if you, can, if you can really actually produce constantly on site. So it's a genuine interest I in I need to be near practice. my books. That's okay. kind of the basic yeah. thing. Uh, but actually, you know, so many of my ideas I'll get just from, you know, in conversation with other people, mm -hmm. um, particularly people who aren't in the art world, you know, and I'll just get an idea. So, you know, that, for me, it's really more, the studio can be so mobile and flexible and just about a discursive space, really. Mm -hmm that one hooks into, not, not physical space. Yeah. But what, for example, is the latest work you've made? Well, I'm working on some works. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm new law and works, yeah. new law, law works. So um, reading legal theory, I'm in sort of legal law libraries and um, talking to lawyers. And the work, you know, happens as a kind of in, in the middle of all that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and you, Christian? You, <laughs> you said you're sort of proud to now have the space, but you never made something in there. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, but I tried and maybe uh, you know, was, was just to see that your 
you know, also like when you, the older you get, or the more uh, happened in this, the more sto story you create as an artist, the, the longer this, uh, the more the over you produce, and the older you get. The also constantly, it's a it's a place for projection. You project yourself on the studio. You know, first when I was in the art academy and not officially there, I was fighting to get a studio space. You know, I had then really I was, you had to go to these professors and even like show your work to everybody in the class. Everybody had to say, yes, you can work next to me here. Or they didn't say, it's not possible, you cannot work in our class. Yeah? And then you really, you know, you had to bite your way through it. And then it was, it was not about the studio place, it was not anymore to have this table. But I think I learned much more in biting yourself through that and facing the others and try to um, uh, say that, you know, you 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 need this table very desperately and to argue it out of uh, your uh, um, artistic position that you say it's not necessary that you, I don't know you do classical painting or sculptures but uh, to you know just to place yourself somewhere and also to create problems with other people next to you to only define yourself even in this act of you know taking space and um, defending your space in a way and then when I finally had it I used it more as a drop of stuff to put my leftover artworks over there, and I didn't use it much, but it was extremely important to have it, just for an own understanding about um, your right to have a studio. Mm -hmm. And I think also, I mean, I made a bit, uh, of course I made a bit fun of myself by saying now I use it as a boutique to sell artworks out. But I mean, I just want to make the point that of course also you, you, you also play with that part, that my, the term of the studio visit is, very, very connected to your studio. You go to any art school in the States or do you do studio visits with, with the students over there? Or creators come and they come and they want to do, do a t schedule in your studio to have a studio visit. You know, it's, it's a very common term. And of course, sim similar like you said, you understood uh, Brancusi different with this book you read in his context. Of course, you represent yourself in the way you talk or you can talk or you can't talk or the way you your studio looks like, the way you present your, your stuff in it. And, um, and then maybe back to the question uh, from Reimer to, to show this, you know, I was trying to link this with the idea to transform the studio into a foundation, which also has this idea, you know, there are so many foundations in former studios of the artists that live there. This exists, it's almost a normal way of, or, or not a normal way, but it's, it's a very common classic way to go. And I don't much believe in afterlife, I don't care much, so much, honestly, on one hand, what people think after I'm dead about my work. I say yes and no. If I'm saying that right now, I feel a bit nervous. Is it really like this? Do I care about what they think about my work when I'm dead? So it's a bit similar, the feeling that I have when people start to touch in the video, the Namjoon Pike uh, vitrine, and they really get down and you think, oh my god, maybe there was a little bit of paint that Nam put on, on this mirror or something, or maybe there's a hand tip, or maybe it's something that's not cool to wipe it off. So but there's the, even though Namjoon Pike declared it as an artwork, but it, it, it didn't feel like working inside of his videos or inside of his installations and uh, changing something in there. I don't know if that somehow makes any sense. I wanted to come to this point where a studio is really let up as a holy space, where you think, no, this is a place for inspiration. This is where he really had this unique thing going on. And it, it is somehow, I think, touching that people discuss so hardly about it, that the director of the museum defends it so strong that the curator thinks it's very fundamental to do this piece to challenge the reading of Namjoon Pike. I was not interested so much. I mean, I think Namjoon Pike was a good example for do this, for doing this, but it could have been also another artist. And uh, it was more about a commentary on memorabilia and on, on, on this way of cult around the studio space. Yeah, I mean, in a way, it's, it's a clash of different conceptions of history. You have one conception of history as something which is um, to be preserved in its material entity, but which is over, which is the, the enshrinement. Uh, it has happened, that's it. 
so you must protect it. That there is something logical to that. Mm -hmm. uh, ideal would be zero degrees Celsius, total darkness, no visitors. Uh, and the other, which is the dream of all conservatories, of course. Uh, the other logic is uh, history is, is a process which is constantly rewritten. I mean, this is the, the, the fluxus point of view. It's, of course, my point of view, your point of view, probably. Um, uh, and there, the material entity is not so important, of course. It's more important that uh, Namjoon Pikes remains part of our own life. I felt very sort of touched to see his Olivetti typewriter. Like, I had the same one. And it sort of reminds one that that uh, time, uh, uh, yeah, that that yeah. that uh, that this this is also a, um, a living being was there in '82 and had this machine. So, that, but, but I agree, I would also uh, be part of of your way mm -hmm. of, of dealing with it. Yeah. But I also I even think that the process of cleaning something, of course, is something that's also, you know, of course, very. Um, um, it's a positive thing as well to clean something that also means that you celebrate something that you think, uh, you know, it can be replaced the same way how you document it once upon a time. Because behind the four people that were cleaning, there were like seven archivists that had video cameras on and really knew already <laughs> that they had to replace everything exactly on the same spot where it was before. So I think that also reactivates and revitalizes even Namjoon Pike Studio. So I don't mm. think it as a pure critique on memorabilia as a new shrine to mm -hmm. pray in, into, but I also think it as a homage. Mm -hmm. I want to, maybe, I also read this Daniel Berin text some, some years ago, and when I remember right, his argument in the first part was that the studio is some kind of, that the, the work is isolated from the real world in the studio. He said, the studio is an ivory tower of production. And we never talked about this tonight, and uh, why? Why, why, do you mean why did we not talk about it, yeah. or? Because it doesn't exist so much. You know, you're invited to artists that don't have a real, <laughs> typical studio practice. Maybe you should have invited Daniel Richter or somebody. No, but I think Dave Berg really shown that why, why would it matter and what would it bring to the discussion to rename yeah. that space once again like that? I think it, it does, that's the, the some, some kind of haunted aspect of the studio discussion is that one returns over and over again to these terms while I think these two practices show that it's not a matter of abdicating like Buran does at the end, it's pathetic, he says, I destroyed uh, uh, what word is used um, in French? Uh, I should know it basically. Anyway, but he, he starts with the destruction of the studio. It's a pathetic move yeah. to do that while uh, there is no other space within the art world, like the gallery or the museum or the house of the collector, that any artist would feel to demolish. Apparently, the studio is. So I think it's liberating not to return once and again, uh, over and over again, but rather try to see the intricacy of that space, that condition of work. It's a, it's a condition of work that can shift, that can uh, take up other spaces and identifying it. It's, I think it's a problem with identifying it with this old image. What happens, for example, in reconstruction is to make it into a fixed image. While well, I think many artist practices today show that leaving is an option, coming back is an option, maybe not having one, but thinking about one, maybe buying one, maybe not buying one, maybe having one that is vacant, whatever. So I think it's, more, it's much more interesting to see the, the intelligence of approach within specific practices than to try and find very antagonistic attitudes. So this ivory tower, it never was, basically. So Buren makes it this... Uh, 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 clear cut to define his own position, which is very debatable at the very same time. Uh, but so that's also another discussion. Just a good slogan, thinking about your work again, the Dan Daniel Buren uh, slogan. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course, it's almost a little bit, um, you know, as an artist, when you are in the hotel, for example, they always ask you for your profession. It took me some years to write down artist, because you feel a bit pathetic to write it down there. And it's, 
a bit similar. If you call something you work in studio, of course, it doesn't look like maybe your first imagination about a studio, but you work there and out of there somehow something will be produced that will be shown in galleries or museums. So, I mean, I felt a little bit more relaxed after while calling it also studio. But you all look so bored, maybe give some very hard questions to us or like say it's total bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer, come on. Okay, there so must be something. Yeah, there must be something. Um, I don't know how to say this. I think it really struck me when Walter, you were talking about how Superflex gave away the the pieces of soul of it or the copies that they chose to do it with the lottery and i think what all of these uh, practices or what they've all described have in common is that there's always an attempt even if the studio physically disappears to recreate the je ne sais quoi the unknown of of creation to give it some kind of positioning so they do it with the lottery right <laughs> and i think in the case of carrie it would be the unconscious and it's also doubly located in the unconscious, but also in the fact that these um, corporations are taking over these ideas of imagination and trying to give them a, um, an origin, so to speak. You know, I don't know, the apple think differently or whatever like that. And I think that's the conflict there. Is it in the unconscious of the person, this, which is also a je ne sais quoi, or is it in the, the idea of what you could do if you bought the computer? And then I think with yours, it's in the, yeah, it's obviously in the fetishism of the positioning of the objects, but also this idea of cleaning. They're the beautiful cleaning company. Or <laughs> there is also this element of the unknown, of would it be better to clean and preserve the things or to make them more dirty or, you know. And I think in yours, it's more about this, uh, where would it, is it in this passage between people and then this unknown of putting, you know, water and spit from someone else into your, it's, in a, it's almost a biological je ne sais quoi, right? Of taking the spit from, and water from someone else. So what I would say is at the end, if I want to be a bit critical, <laughs> even though the studios disappear from your practices and the things you've described, I think there's always an attempt to reinscribe the studio as a mythologi mythological space, a space of, authenticity, this idea, a uh, Kantian idea of um, where is creativity coming from, this schopferische, undefinable quality, or who is it, Pierre, is it Pierre Bourg, who said, who defined it as a je ne sais quoi, this or unidentifiable element of creativity. And I think ultimately in all of your works, it's reinscribed, so the studio disappears as a physical space, but what's interesting is going off the gold standard, maybe it's related to what you talked about, that the artists and the art went off the gold standard of the studio, the physical location. And what's interesting is to see how the, the origin or the, the je ne sais quoi, the undefinability of this schopferische creativität, which also could be religious or something, is re-inscribed constantly in different places. Even in the corner, it's a bit this paradoxical space that's created and not created, and, and that I find really interesting. I don't know if that makes sense, but I could, the criticism I would say, sorry, that's not really a question. <laughs> But maybe the criticism would be is, aren't you, in the end, by destroying the studio, in some way quite um, nostalgic about it and trying to reconstruct it in immaterial ways, right? As a schopferische Ursprung, Herr Ursprung. Vielleicht haben Sie die Antwort. <laughs> yeah, no, it, 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 it's, it's, I think it's a very good remark. And in some sense, um, uh, I think that uh, Steve uh, Jobs, uh, uh, he he sold uh, studios like these. These uh, why are these computers called books? Um, uh, I think it, there's there is um, the, the economy is so much focused on consumption that the production as such sort of disappears. Yet it it, it almost becomes mystified, uh, uh, fetishized if you want, and then you can look at it somewhere in Korea or you can imagine to be 
creative yourself, and this has to be materialized in some sense, and I think that the click of, of the book that we all have uh, is, is sort of a, a micro-studio that, that we can carry around uh, with us, uh, which, which, uh, which creates some kind of autonomy in, in a positive sense, but it's also, of course, uh, easy to exploit and to, to exchange. I mean, so it's very ambivalent. So, uh, yes, I would say that the... Um, the discussion about the studio uh, has a lot to do with uh, nostalgia uh, for a s uh, kind of production that is pre precarious. Uh. In my viewpoint, the Capro was someone who understood that and articulates it in a very early phase, um, already trying to uh, produce alternatives and, and ways of escaping that. So I, I would not see him as a nostalgic artist, such as perhaps uh, uh, um, um, uh, Oldenburg or Bruce Nauman uh, would be, but as someone who understands the, the change that happens with immaterial labor. But it's my interpretation. He does never talk about it. You know? But I think there's a difference between nostalgia or trying to relate to history in an uh, intricate fashion, and I think that's a big difference. I think I try to describe a project that is the utter opposite of nostalgia, is amnesia, is not knowing. So it's not even re-inscribing the project within a tradition that I think either creators or art curators or artists at least should have some kind of knowledge about. So that's, I guess, more the other um, movement that I try to describe than making a plea for a nostalgic notion or adherence to the studio. Rather, that some projects go so much the other way that you lose so much historical knowledge and, and uh, um, uh, understanding that I find that equally problematic as nostalgia. I think it's somewhere in the middle. You can probably either escape one or the other. But I think in a museum context, not being knowledgeable about such a fabulous, and then I'm, then I'm nostalgic, definitely so. When I speak about Bergkijk, Nebato, and seeing Robert Morris there with Barbara Rose, definitely so. But that's the historian's, I guess, uh, um, uh, addiction to those material uh, stuff. But for a contemporary project as the Superflex one, I cannot understand why they are not aware and did not inscribe that history within their project. Rather, no, I, I, I don't agree with that because yeah. a lottery it's, is it's is addressing in terms dumb of people. The content, yeah. but I'm sorry, that's what makes it a reactionary project in the end. However, destructive they want to be of the idea of origin and creativity and authenticity. In the end, they reinscribe all of those ideas by giving the pieces of work away by chance because they say, we don't, are not responsible for it, we give it over to chance, which is basically saying, I let you know, God throw the dice or whoever. It's the, same, it's the same idea. So while they criticize it, I agree with you in terms of the content and the history and all of those things, they basically say something very okay. different mm -hmm. by giving it away with the tumbler. It's the je ne sais quoi, I don't know the, uh, the origin of all art, is, and you can't define it, right? From Père Bohour to, to Kant, it remains undefinable. So they reinscribe yeah. that that very traditional reactionary notion of creativity with the what's it called tombla or tombla tombla whatever yeah yeah but I guess I, I might find it a too voluntaristic interpretation because I think a tombla addresses you as a dumb like uh, not capable of making any conscious decision because you buy a ticket and that's the only intelligent decision even not. You make. It depends on the amount of money you have, basically. Yeah, but I think there is a such a conceptual decision for a tombola, which is mostly, as I remember it from my youth, all the excess products that are never being sold in a shop. That what ends up in a tombola. That's what you get. So it's it's this procedure. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. But what I find interesting about the lottery is that. Uh, the Kunstvereine, when they were founded in the 19th century and they wanted to sell, they were kind of pre, 
Vorläufer of uh, galleries, of private galleries, they also did lotteries because the, uh, their visitors or the buyers didn't know what to buy and so they made it like this. I, I don't get it. What's wrong with the lottery? I, I think I, I, I like the lottery because you don't have to be rich to get it. Everyone pays the same thing, maybe two euro to get, and then you, and think, I think that's what they want, to get some kind of new, not that, 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 uh, that uh, so Louis piece is only for, for really, really rich people. But that's exactly, that's exactly what's inscribed within the notion of a formula and a certificate is the openness of it. It's an intellectual proposition. And I guess that's what I think is a sort of ethical stance, what was in the last quote, is that you address your viewers as possibly intelligent people that might not understand, might understand, but you make work that addresses them as intelligent human beings. And that's what the lottery doesn't do, basically. But maybe we're thinking of too much in the lottery discussion. Um, but I guess, I, to me, it goes against the grain of the ethical stance that is within the uh, cutting loose of a project and its production uh, within conceptual art. Christian? I, just, I don't know, maybe I didn't get it, but uh, the the people that worked inside of the shop in the museum, in, 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 into this um, metal shop, they were like professional welders from this other company where also Solovit worked with? No. no because that was one moment that you also attacked. Because logically, you would say, you know, if an uh, idea cannot be stolen, like Solovit said it, the visitor to do it themselves. They should be instructed to make it themselves over there, if you already bring it into the museum. But I don't. 